All right, it's time to begin. Everybody can take a seat. <laughs> We are beginning a new class tonight for the next couple of months. We'll be looking at the books of Judges and Ruth. So if you want to go ahead and be turning over to Judges chapter 1, we'll begin there in just a moment. Uh, we're going to have a number of teachers for this class. Uh, I will be teaching tonight and next week, and I don't know... Um, exactly who takes over after that, um, but uh, somebody will, I'm reasonably assured. Tonight is going to be a bit of an introduction to, uh, to the book of Judges, and uh, we'll try to, try to get down to the first part of, through the first part of chapter 3 tonight, but um, there, there is a lot of introductory material uh, about this book that we need to cover to kind of set up what we're going to be looking at through the rest of the book. The book of Judges is known um, for, among other things, probably the darkest period of, of uh, Israel's history, and it, it follows chronologically um, behind and uh, uh, canonically behind the book of Joshua. The book of Joshua was all about the conquest of the land of Canaan, the promised land. And uh, we're moving a, a generation or two or three into or after that conquest uh, when we start into the book of Judges. But there are some accounts in the book of Judges that are truly dark. Um, dark times, dark things done by the people of God. Some of the things that are done by the people of God, once we get over to chapter uh, 19, chapter 20, were um, similar, very similar to what was described of the city of Sodom in particular, but Sodom and Gomorrah back in Genesis 19, and that led to the destruction of those cities. Um, and the things that we find in the book of Judges almost led to the destruction of the tribe of Benjamin. And so, again, truly, truly dark uh, times covered in the book of Judges. The book of Ruth, uh, which will be covered later in, uh, in this course, really kind of serves as a bright spot in that period of the Judges, that time period of the Judges. Uh, what I wrote up here on the board uh, if you can see it, is really kind of an outline, not a textual outline, but, but more a philosophical outline of the book of Judges because it describes a cycle, and I've got it on both sides to make it easier for you to see, but a cycle that the Israelites found themselves in in the book of Judges, and uh, that cycle would, be, would begin with sin, and we're going to see them get into that cycle tonight. Uh, sin followed by servitude, a consequence of a sin. They would find themselves in servitude to a nation among their neighbors, and those, uh, those would uh, vary from uh, cycle to cycle. That followed by supplication, turning to God, and then that followed by God raising a judge, salvation. And then when the judge died, before long, a generation goes by, and they're right back into the same cycle. And one of the things that occurred to me as I was writing that is, do you ever find yourself in that same cycle? It seems to me sometimes that my address is right in the middle of that, of that uh, circle. Um, and not so much my physical address, but wherever I am in my spiritual journey, this seems to sometimes revolve around me. It's, it's a struggle that we all have to have to put up with. We all have to deal with. We all, we all have to try to overcome. And uh, so I, that's the reason I put that up there because that really does describe a lot of what we see 
the children of Israel, and we'll see this tonight, are going to suffer enslavement again as a direct result of their lives, of their choosing to abandon the law of God. Let's stop here and have a word of prayer, and then we'll continue on. Father, we are so thankful to you for this uh, class, this opportunity to come together and to study your word. Uh, Father, we, we are mindful of how much we need your word in our life to help us to be able to resist this cycle so that we don't get caught in this trap, but that we live as you would have us to live. I pray that tonight you will have, help us to focus our minds on what your word says and help us to learn how to resist the temptation that is all around us in this world. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, when you go back into um, the history of these people, back into, uh, let's go back into the Exodus, very shortly after the uh, children of Israel leave Egypt, they are still encamped around uh, or at the foot of Mount Sinai where they re they received the law. And they're going to be here at this in this place for quite some time. But in Exodus chapter 23, verses 31 through 33, God told the Israelites about what was coming when they go into the promised land. Now at this point in time, they don't know, God does, but they don't know that it's going to be another 40 years before they get there. And from their point of view, what they know now is right down the road. And so here's what he tells them. Beginning in verse 31, Exodus 23, I will fix your boundary from the Red Sea to the Sea of the Philistines and from the wilderness to the river Euphrates, for I will deliver the inhabitants of the land into your hand, and you will drive them out before you. You shall make no covenant with them or with their gods. And then verse 33, they shall not live in your land, because they will make you sin against me. For if you serve their gods, it will surely be a snare to you. They will not live in your land, because if they do, if you serve their gods, it will surely be a snare to you. Well, let's move forward about 40 years, almost 40 years. The, in the book of Numbers, we find the 12 uh, spies being sent into the land of Canaan, and they come out just scared to death. They're, they're giants over there. And it's very interesting. Everybody in here probably is familiar with the phrase uh, grasshoppers in their sight. That actually starts out by saying we were grasshoppers in our own sight. And thus we became grasshoppers in their sight. And the, what I tell the, the students, and we're getting ready to start this, uh, this quarter talking about this, um, God didn't send the spies or didn't have the spies sent into the land of Canaan to see if they could take it. He sent them into the land of Canaan to see what he was about to give to them. But they were scared to death. You know the story. And because of that, they were 40 days in, the, in Canaan. For every day the spies were in Canaan, they were going to be in the wilderness a year. So 40 years until that whole generation that heard that command in Exodus 23, drive them out, they won't live with you in the land, till they were all gone. And now in Deuteronomy chapter 7, beginning in verse 1, when the Lord your God brings you into the land where you are entering to possess it, and clears away many nations before you, the Hittites, and the Girgashites, and the Amorites, and the Canaanites, and the Perizzites, and the and the Hivites and the Jebusites, seven nations greater and stronger than you. And when the Lord your God delivers them before you and you defeat them, then you shall utterly destroy them. You shall make no covenant with them and show no favor to them. Furthermore, you shall not intermarry with them. You shall not give your daughters to their sons, nor shall you take their daughters for your sons. 
For they will turn your sons away from following me to serve <laughs> other gods. Then the anger of the Lord will be kindled against you, and he will quickly destroy you. But thus you shall do to them, you shall tear down their altars, and smash their sacred pillars, and hew down their asherim, and burn their graven images with fire. For you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his own possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. Skip down to verse 16. You shall consume all the peoples whom the Lord your God will deliver to you. Your eye shall not pity them, nor shall you serve their gods, for that would be, and there's our word again, a snare to you. Skip down to verse 25. The graven images of their gods you are to burn with fire. You shall not covet the silver or the gold that is on them, nor take it for yourselves, or you will be snared by it. There's our word. For it is an abomination to the Lord your God. It's been said that the law of Moses, given starting in Exodus chapter 20, and really continuing on through uh, the rest of Exodus into Leviticus, a little bit in Numbers, a repetition of all that in the book of Deuteronomy, that that was given as an inoculation, if you will, a vaccination. It told those Israelites, that law and that history, everything that's written in the, in the first five books, told the Israelites who they were, whose they were, where they came from, and what God expected of them when they got to where they were going. And in that sense, a bit of an inoculation against what they were going to be exposed to in this new land. Now, we, I grew up, and I'm sure many of you did as well, hearing this described, and Scripture uses this term, the promised land, a land flowing with milk and honey. And it just becomes almost, a, uh, in the minds of the people that were were headed that way when they weren't complaining about it, see the book of Numbers, a, a, a kind of a, an image of heaven. I mean, things are just going to be so great there. And it was a promised land. It was a land flowing with milk and honey. But that description is really only about the potential of that land if the people obeyed these commands that we read in Exodus 23 and Deuteronomy 7. Drive out the people. Do what God wants them uh, wants you to do. Live how he wants you to live. And if you obey these commands, time and again in the Pentateuch, if you obey these commands, you'll live long in the land. Now the Apostle Paul is going to refer back to that in Ephesians chapter 6. When he's talking about, he starts off, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. For this is the first commandment with a promise. If you'll allow me to paraphrase here, do what your parents tell you so that you'll live longer. That's really what the Apostle Paul is getting at, but it's a reference back to, if you'll do what God tells you to do, then you'll be long in the land. You'll possess it. You won't be as affected by the temptations, the, the, the germs, if you will, the filthiness, if you will, that is in the land of Canaan. You know, what happens in the book of Judges, and this really is a, a very good object lesson, a case in point of what happens when you don't do what God says. In this case, the consequences of their physical lives were exactly what God said would happen if you don't. You know, the, the book of Deuteronomy is all about two things. Obey and receive blessing. Disobey and receive judgment. And now in, Ju in uh, the book of Judges, we see that happening. What would happen if you go visit your doctor You've got some symptoms, and the doctor examines you and said and diagnoses diagnoses these symptoms. 
says, you've got this issue, you need this medicine, writes you a prescription, and you take the prescription down to the pharmacy, fill the prescription, take it home, put it in the medicine cabinet, and leave it there. But I've got the cure. But you've still got the disease, don't you? What happens if, okay, we, we've been through, and some people think we're not through, uh, the pandemic that we've just been experiencing for going on uh, three years now in March. And, boy, when that thing started, everything was about disinfectant, wasn't it? I mean, you couldn't find disinfectant in the, in the stores. Uh, every time, once we started coming back to worship here at the building, after every worship, and for a while we were dividing that up so we didn't have so many people in the auditorium upstairs, we're twice, uh, two worship services every Sunday morning. And after both of those, after each one of those, we're wiping down every pew in the room, in the uh, auditorium with disinfectant. Well, what happens if we take the medicine, but we don't get rid of the germs? We don't disinfect. What happens if we don't wash our hands? If we don't take those precautions? Well, we're leaving ourselves at risk, aren't we? There were people who remained faithful to God through this period in Genesis. And there will be people who are a little more resistant to infection and other um, I'll just, for lack of a better word, germs can survive that better than others, have a stronger uh, uh, resistance or immune system to things like that. But generally speaking, if, we're, if we don't disinfect, if we don't clean up the environment around us, we're susceptible. And it's just as true in the spiritual sense. And again, the children of Israel in the book of Judges are a great case in point of the spiritual application of that very thing. In fact, look at uh, Judges chapter 1, and I'm going to start reading in verse 4. Judah went up, Judges 1 verse 4, Judah went up, and the Lord gave the Canaanites and the Perizzites into their hands, and they defeated 10,000 men at Bezek. And they found uh, Adani Bezek, which is basically the Lord of Bezek, in Bezek, and fought against him, and they defeated the Canaanites and the Perizzites. But Adani Bezek fled, and they pursued him, and caught him, and cut off his thumbs and big toes. Now you may stop right there and think, what in the world? Whoever came up with that as a punishment? Well, let's read on. Adonibazek said, Seventy kings with their thumbs and their big toes cut off used to gather up scraps under my table. As I have done, so God has repaid me. So they brought him to Jerusalem and he died there. Apparently, Cutting off the thumbs and big toes of the enemy was a practice of some of the Canaanites, apparently at least of Adonibazek. That's how you treated captive kings. So already we're in chapter 1 of Judges, and already instead of killing and destroying the Canaanites, Somebody had the bright idea, let's do to him what he did to all those other guys. I read an article about this that I found very fascinating. The idea was with no thumbs, you can't grasp a sword or a knife. So a captive king can't rebel against you and try to take your life. Mm -hmm. Without his big toes, he can't walk well. He loses his balance constantly. Mm -hmm. So he is subject because he, he physically can't do the things that he needs to do to either fight back against you or to run away. Yeah. And I found that very interesting. I always thought it was weird. Why'd they cut off their big toes? And why'd mm -hmm. they cut off their thumbs? Yeah. Uh, but I, I found that fascinating. 
Well, and there's no indication that the Israelites had ever done anything like this or thought anything like this until they're there doing that to somebody who always did that. And so even in that sense, and, and some may think this is a, kind of a, an innocuous thing. I mean, it's not that big a deal. But they've already violated the command to destroy the enemy, drive them completely out, and they're being influenced by the practice that was done before them. So, if you don't take the medicine, you're susceptible to what's going on. Now, and I'm going to make more application towards the end of this, but let's, let's bring this up to us. We live in the world today. We're not of the world, but we are in the world, as, as Jesus would say. Is our world, and I, I'm not really, I'm not really talking about a, a matter of degree, are we as, I know some people think, you know, living in the world today, it's as bad as Sodom ever was. Well, no, it's not. You, you need to go back and see how bad that was. Uh, or as bad as Judges chapters 19 and 20. No, but it's bad enough, isn't it? Do we not live in an evil, wicked world? I would argue that we do. Now, Jesus said, John 8, verse 31, If you abide in my word, then you are truly my disciples. Verse 32, and you will know the truth if you abide in my word. And the truth will set you free if you abide in my word. There's the cure, isn't it? We'll be set free. But what if we don't take the cure? We got it. It's not in my medicine cabinet. It might be on my coffee table. It might be on my bookshelf at home. We've got the cure. But we don't take it. What is different in application between what happened to the children of God in the book of Judges and what will happen to the children of God today if we don't take the medicine any more than they took the medicine. Is there really any difference? I would argue no. There's not. So again, the book of Judges is, is a great illustration of just what happens when God's people, and again, today that would be us, and the lesson is exactly the same. Stop taking this inoculation uh, against the, uh, the influence of this world, that inoculation being the word of God. Now, uh, it occurred to me when I first started thinking about teaching this class and next week, uh, we're going to begin the book of Judges, but because of weather, we never got to finish the book of Joshua. So I thought I would begin tonight by finishing the book of Joshua. Joshua died, now we're in the book of Judges. <laughs> but then, as I began really studying this it occurred to me that <laughs> there really is a connection between the end of Joshua and the beginning of the book of Judges uh, the uh, and we don't really have time to, to go into all of the, of the end of the book of Joshua but the events of Joshua 24 the last chapter of Joshua <clears throat> are kind of repeated in Judges chapter 1 not in every detail, but the death of Joshua is covered in chapter 24 of Joshua, chapter 1 in the book of Judges, and again in chapter 2 of the book of Judges. And so there really is an, an overlap here uh, of what was going on. And, and I would caution us not to understand the events of, actually, um, I would say the, the three chapters, first three chapters of Judges, but we could include the last two chapters of Joshua to be happening in a necessarily a, a chronological order. Now, maybe 23 and 24 chronologically line up that way with respect to each other. But uh, Joshua 23 begins by telling us that Joshua is old, advanced in years, and God gave the Israelites rest uh, from all of the enemies around them, um, before he died, and yet Judges chapter 1, verse 1 and following, chapter 1, verse 1 talks about Joshua died, 
And immediately, verse 2, they're still fighting. There are still enemies around. We're going to get down to chapter 3 in Judges and find that God had intentionally left some of these tribes in Canaan to test the Israelites because they were already proving that they were not going to follow the law of God the way that their, the previous few generations had done. I, I've heard it said that, that the generation that marched the generation of Israelites that marched across, out of the wilderness, across the uh, Jordan River and into, the, into uh, Canaan, may very well be the most faithful generation of Israelites that the scriptures talk about, ever talk about. And that may be true. The generation that starts the book of Judges may be the other end of that spectrum. They may be the most unfaithful. Um, one of the most telling verses of the book um, found is found in chapter 2 and verse 10. Judges 2 and verse 10. All that generation also were gathered to their fathers, and there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord, nor yet the work which he had done for Israel. Now that generation, um, at the beginning of that, all that generation also were gathered to their fathers. That generation really is referring to the generation of Joshua and the generation of the elders who survived Joshua. Uh, Joshua 24, 31 um, said that Israel served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who survived Joshua. And then along comes this generation. Why did they not know the Lord? And as I read that just now, uh, it reminded me of, again, going back to the Exodus in, um, early, in the early chapters of the book of Exodus when Moses first goes to Pharaoh to say, let my people go. Do you remember what Pharaoh said? This has got to be one of the most poignant questions ever asked in human history, but certainly in scripture, who is the Lord that I should obey his voice? And to me, that's just, I, I know sometimes I have a twisted brain, but that just strikes me as one of the dumbest things anybody has ever said. It's almost as though God said, what do you mean, sir? Well, I'll show you who I am. And he did. And now you've got a generation of Israelites who are in the same boat. They did not know the Lord or the things that he had done for Israel. Now I have to ask the question, why did they not know the Lord? Well again, let's go back to the book of Deuteronomy chapter 6. Chapter uh, 6, verse 4, is known as the Shema. It's a very well-known passage. Um, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. But if you skip down a couple of verses to verse 6, he writes, These words which I am commanding you today you shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your sons and shall talk of, uh, talk of them when you sit down in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand. They shall be as frontals on your forehead. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. Make three by five cards to put on your bathroom mirror or your refrigerator. Then it shall come about when the Lord your God brings you into the land which he swore to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you great and splendid cities which you did not build and houses full of all good things which you did not build and hewn cisterns which you did not dig, vineyards and olive trees which you did not plant, and you eat and are satisfied, then watch yourself that you do not forget the Lord who brought you from the land of Egypt out of the house of slavery. I ask the question, why did they not know the Lord or the things that he had done for them? And the answer to that question is very simple. Because somewhere between Deuteronomy 6 
In Judges chapter 2, fathers, parents, stopped obeying Deuteronomy 6. Somebody stopped that. A generation stopped that. This verse, Judges 2 and verse 10, sets up this cycle. Look at verses 11 and 12 of Judges 2. Then the sons of Israel did evil. After saying, a generation arose that did not know the Lord, did not know the things that he had done for Israel. Then the sons of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals. And they forsook the law of the Lord, the God of their fathers, who had brought them out of the land of Egypt and followed other gods from among the gods of the people who were around them and bowed themselves down to them. Thus they provoked the Lord to anger. There was sin. There was sin. Remember what he said in Deuteronomy 6? Watch yourself. That you do not forget the Lord who brought you up from the land of Egypt out of the house of slavery. Why? This is why. Again, application. If you abide in my word, then you're my disciples, then you know the truth, then you are set free by that truth. Watch yourself. Watch yourself. By not following God's command, <clears throat> command to completely destroy the peoples of Canaan, those cultures did in fact become a snare to the Israelites. And they began to go and worship other gods. Starting in verse 14 of chapter 2, the author seems to give an, an overview of this cycle. It's going to be played out the rest of the book. But, and I'm not going to read all of these verses, but in verse 14, God's anger burned against Israel. That's not ever a position we want to be in, is it? On the receiving end of that. You know, when uh, the people rebelled, when God told them, after the report of the, the ten evil spies, that they were going to have to, they were going to have to be in the wilderness for another forty years, and they rebelled against that. And God killed a bunch of them. The next day, the people rebelled again, and the anger of the Lord burned against the whole congregation. And in, in that particular case, the anger of the Lord burning against the congregation caused the congre the 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 uh, camp to catch on fire. I mean, when it says he burned, his anger burned, and he wasn't talking about he, his face turned red. And more people died. This is not ever anything Israel or anybody else wants to experience. Verse 14, God's anger burned against the Lord. He sold them into the hands of their enemies around them. Verse 14, also servitude. Verse 16, the Lord raised up judges who delivered them. He doesn't mention the supplication in this particular round, but he gets to salvation. He provides the judges, and that's what we're going to see in the rest of the book. And the people sinned again. And again, played the harlot after other gods. Back up to sin. The Lord raised up more judges, being with the judges and delivering the people all the days of each judge, being moved to pity by their groanings, verse 18. So he skipped the servitude, but now he's talking with the groanings about the supplication. And then when the judges died, and the salvation, and when the judges died, verse 19, they would turn back and act more wickedly, more corruptly than their fathers. A vicious cycle. Verse 19. And then 20 through 22, and so the anger of the Lord would burn against them, and he left nations who would test the Israelites. Again, verses 20 through 22. Cycle. And then when you get to chapter 3, those, those six verses, <clears throat> first six verses of the chapter, those nations that were left to test Israel 
are identified and the Israels fall ultimately into the snare their fathers had been warned against, warned about generations before. Look at verse 6. And they took their daughters for themselves as wives and gave their own daughters to their sons and served their idols. Isn't that exactly what God said would happen? It is. Just exactly as God said. Don't give your daughters to them and take their daughters for yourselves or the other way. Don't give your sons to them and take their sons because if you do, it'll be a snare. Sometimes it's, it seems to me anyway, it's very easy for us to read about what happened to the people of God, <clears throat> different individuals maybe, or whole peoples. Uh, we, we see them acting in, in such a way. Why would they do that? It's so easy for us to see and point out their mistakes, especially when Scripture identifies mis those mistakes. Why would they do that? The question ought to be, why do we have these examples in Scripture and we do the exact same thing? Because we do, don't we? I do. You know, usually I, I say, I don't know about you, but I do. But I kind of know about you, too. We do the same thing. I am convinced of this as much as I'm convinced of anything about Scripture. When Paul wrote to the Romans and said the things written in earlier times are written for your instruction or our instruction. That's what he was talking about. I'm glad that every time we do something wrong in worship, preacher misspeaks, um, somebody leading in worship does something that's maybe not intentionally, maybe carelessly, that fire doesn't come out of the, the pulpit or the communion table and devour us like it did in Adam and Abide. I'm glad that doesn't happen. But I'm glad we have the example that we do of that. Those things should teach us. And here we have people who are just like us, who just don't know God. And they suffer the consequences. Have parents that don't teach their children like they should, and they suffer the consequences. What's different today? Let's make some application as we bring this uh, to a close. And, and I do make this point. This uh, last a week ago Sunday, um, I finished up the cl a class in here on Sunday mornings uh, called In Pursuit of Holiness. And I make this point in that class from the book of Leviticus. But our, our, this study on Judges is, is a, a great object lesson on that. The point is this. God expects his people to be holy as he is holy. 1 Peter uh, 1, verses 14 through 16. And, you know, we need, to, we need to be holy in all of our behavior. As the Holy One who called you, he said in verse 15, be holy yourselves. Verse 16, for it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. That's what God expects of us. And again, we, we already made this application some earlier, but we have that same command. Not just in Leviticus. I just mentioned uh, 1 Peter uh, 1. But one of the things that, that I, I learned in preparation for that study from the book of Leviticus and talking about holiness is just how much all of scripture is really about one thing and that's being faithful to God being what God wants us to be and I, I'm reminded of Ephesians 4 and verse 1 he says I, I, I'm urging you with much entreaty one of the versions says to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called what is that calling? Well, I've in years past said, look, it's to be a Christian. If you're a Christian, live 
like a Christian, is what that's getting at. I would, I would modify that answer a little bit now. It's to be holy. Like the Holy One who called us is holy. That's what God expects. And so we have, we have these other books that talk about these things, and we have the book of Judges. It says, and here's what happens when, you, when you're not doing that. This is, is what happens when you don't do, when you're not walking in a manner worthy of the calling with which you've been called. We've got the medicine, but if we don't take it, we won't be cured. And teach those children. Again, I'm convinced this whole book is about what happens when generations do not teach the next generation what God expects of them. I was thinking about this uh, today as I was putting these uh, thoughts together. How many times over the years I've heard people talk about um, an ancestor, a, a, a close ancestor of theirs, a, a parent, grandparent, great-grandparent. And we, we've got some examples in the Lord's Church of, of families that generation have produced generations of gospel preachers. I think that's wonderful. Um, and, and if we were to go around the room, there would be different answers to how far back. Are you, know, are you a first generation Christian, a second generation, third generation, tenth generation, whatever it might be. And one of the things that I've noticed over the years is how very often, not always, and I would never make this a blanket statement, but how, how very often there will be a faithful Christian whose grandchildren, great-grandchildren are not faithful in the least. Now, again, I don't know the circumstances, and I, I would never even try to guess, but I can't help but wonder, since we have examples of the same thing in Scripture, and I know that, you know, no, noting the, the difference in the spirituality of one generation to two or three generations down the road doesn't mean that one of those generations just didn't care about their kids. I'm not saying that at all. What I am saying is that parents need to work hard. To do the best you possibly can, teach those children. That's what God expects. And tell them, this is what happens. Teach them what God says, but teach them to teach their kids what God says, what the Word is all about. You know, I've heard people who appear, for all intents and purposes, I'm not anybody's judge, but they appear to be worldly in every respect, brag on the grandfather, grandparents, or parent that was a pillar of in the church, in his or her time. And they say it almost as though that fact guarantees them a place in heaven. Someone said to me, and I didn't come up with this, and I don't remember now who said it, though, but someone said to me one time, you know, God doesn't have any grandkids. We don't get to go to heaven because of the faith of a parent or a grandparent or a great-grandparent. It's so important that we teach our children and then pray for them because the best teaching that we give them, they still have to take the medicine, don't they? Those are the lessons that, that I think we learn from at least this part in the book of Judges and maybe from the whole book in Judges is let's let's follow what God says. Let's do what God says we have to do. And let's teach the next generation and the next generation. You know, in, in Deuteronomy 6, he didn't say teach your sons. He said teach your sons and your grandsons. And if you're around, your great-grandsons. Teach them all you can. And I think we're out of time. So 
So thank you very much for your uh, kind attention. And next week, we will move from here into chapter 5. Thanks, Donnie. Do you have uh, you have an announcement I think you were going to make? Yes. I'll turn these off. Can everybody hear me okay? Leela Spencer, uh, one of our uh, shut-ins, is 